this letter that Don Pedro of Aragon comes this night to Messina. <laughs> he is very near by this. He was not three leagues off when I left him. How many gentlemen were lost in this action? But few of any sorts, and none of names. Uh -huh. A victory is twice itself when the achiever brings home full numbers. I find here that Don Pedro has bestowed great honor on a young Florentine called Claudio. Much deserved on his part, and equally rewarded by Don Pedro. He had borne himself beyond the promise of his age, doing in the figure of a lamb the feats of a lion. He hath indeed better bettered expectation than you must expect of me to tell you how. Well, he hath an uncle here. Messina will be very much glad of it. I have already delivered him letters, and there appears much joy. So much that joy could not show itself modest enough. Uh, did he break forth into tears? In great measure. <laughs> a kind overflow of kindness. There are no faces truer than those that are so watched. <laughs> How much better it is to joy at uh, joy at weeping than to joy at laughing? <laughs> I pray you, is the new Mount Honto returned from the wars or no? I know none of that thing, lady. But there were none of any sort in the army. What is he that you ask for, Denise? My uh, cousin means Signor Benedict of Padua. Oh, so he's returned, <laughs> and as pleasant as ever he was. He set up his bills here in Messina and challenged Cupid at the flight. My uncle's fool, reading the challenge, subscribed to Cupid and challenged him at the bird boat. But I pray you, how many hath he killed and eaten in these wars? But how many hath he killed? <laughs> For indeed, I promise to eat all of his killing. <laughs> Faith, niece, you tax Signor Benedict too much. But he'll be meet with you, I doubt it not. <laughs> he has done good service, lady, in these wars. You had a musty victual, and he had help to eat it. He is a very valiant trencherman. Oh. And he has an excellent stomach. <laughs> and a good soldier, too, lady. And a good soldier to a lady. But what is he to a lord? <laughs> a lord to a lord, a man to a man. Stuffed with all honorable uh, virtues. It is so indeed. He is no less than a stuffed man. <laughs> You must not, sir, mistake my niece. There's a kind of merry war betwixt Signor Benedict and her. They never meet, but there's a skirmish of wit between them. Alas, he gets nothing by that. In our last conflict, four of his five wits went halting off. And now it's a whole man governed with one. So that if he have enough wit to keep himself warm, let him bear it out for the difference between himself and his horse. For it is all the wealth he has left to be known a reasonable creature. But who is his companion now? He has every month a new sworn brother. Is it possible? It's very easily possible. He wears his face, but is the fashion of his hat. It ever changes with the next block. I see, lady, the gentleman is not in your books. No, and he were, I would burn my study. <laughs> <laughs> but who is his companion? Is there no young quarreler who will make a voyage with him to the devil? Well, he is most in the company of the right and noble Claudio. Oh, Lord, he will hang upon him like a disease. He is sooner caught than the pestilence. And the tears he <coughs> presently mad. God help the noble Claudio if he have caught the Benedict. It will cost him a thousand pounds ere he be cured. <laughs> I, I will hold friends with you, lady. You, good friend. You will 
never run mad, me. No, not till a hot January. <laughs> Don Pedro has approached. <laughs> Good Senor Leonardo, you are come to meet your trouble. The fashion of the world is to avoid cost, and you encounter it. <laughs> Never came trouble to my house in the likeness of your grace. Where trouble being gone, comfort should remain. But when you depart from me, sorrow lies, and happiness takes its leave. You embrace your charge too willingly. <laughs> I think this is your daughter. Her mother many times told me so. <laughs> <laughs> Were you in doubt, sir, that you asked her? Senor Benedict, no, for then were you a child. <laughs> you have it full, Benedict. We may guess by this what you are, being a man. Well, if Senor Leonardo be her father, she would not have his head on her shoulders for all of Messina as like him as she is. I wonder that you should still be talking, Senor Benedict. Nobody marks you. What, my dear lady disdain. Are you yet living? Is it possible that Stain should die while she has such meat food to feed it as Signor Benedict? Courtesy itself should convert to disdain if you come into presence. <laughs> then is courtesy a turncoat. But it is certain I am loved of all ladies. <gasps> Only you accept it. And I would I confide it in my heart that I have not a hard heart. For truly, I love not. A dear happiness to women. <laughs> they would else have been troubled with a pernicious suitor. I thank God and my cold blood I am of your humor for that. I'd rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. Well, then God keep your ladyship still in that mind. So some gentleman or other shall stake a predestinate scratch face. Scratching could not make it worse than towards such a face as yours were. Well, you are a rare parent, teacher. A bird of my tongue is better than a beast of yours. I would my horse at the speed of your tongue, and so good a continue. I but keep your tongue. way. In God's name, I have done. You, you always end with a jade trick. I know you are old. That is the sum of all, Leonardo. Senor Claudio, Senor Benedict, my dear friend Leonardo has invited you all. Hey! I tell him we shall stay here at least a month, and he heartily prays that some occasion may detain us longer. I dare swear he is no hypocrite, but prays from his heart. <laughs> if you swear, my lord, you shall not be forsworn. <laughs> Let me bid you welcome, my lord. Being reconciled to the prince, your brother, I owe you all duty. I thank you. I am not of many words, but I thank you. Please, your grace, lead on. Your hand, Leonardo. We will go together. <laughs> Of Signor Leonato? I noted her not, but I looked on her. Is she not a modest young lady? Well, do you question me as an honest man should do for my simple, true judgment? Or would you have me speak after my custom as being a professed tyrant to their sex? No, I pray thee, speak in sober judgment. Why, well, faith, me thinks she's too low for a high praise, too brown for a fair praise, and too little for a great praise. <laughs> Only this combination I can afford her that were she other than she is, she is unhandsome. And being no other but as she is, I do not like her. Thou thinkest I am poor. I pray thee, tell me truly how thou likest her. Would you buy her that you inquire after her? Can the world buy such a jewel? Yea, in a case to put it into. <laughs> Speak you this with a sad brow, or? <laughs> or do you play the flouting jack to tell us Cupid is a good hair finder and Vulcan a rare carpenter? Come, in what key shall a man take you to go in the song? In mine eyes. I see yet without spectacles, and I see no such matter. <laughs> now there's her cousin, and was she not possessed with the fury? Exceeds her as much in beauty as the first of May or the last of December. But I hope you have no intent to turn husband, have you? I would scarce trust myself. Though I had sworn the contrary, a hero would be my wife. It's come to this! In faith, hath not the world one man but he will wear his cap with suspicion? 
Shall I never see a bachelor of three score again? Well, go to it, Faith. And if thou wilt needs, thrust thy neck into a yoke, wear the print of it, and sign away Sundays. <laughs> oh, look, Don Pedro is returning to seek you. What secret has held you here that you follow Dr. Leonardo? I would your grace would constrain me to tell. I charge thee on thy allegiance. You hear this, Count Tavio? I can be as secret as a dumb man, I'll have you think so, but on my allegiance. Mark you this, on my allegiance. He is in love. With who? Now that is for your grace's part. Mark how short his answer is. With Hero, Leonardo's short daughter. <laughs> if this were so, so were it uttered. Like the old tale, my lord, it is not so, nor twas not so, but indeed, God forbid it should be so. And if my passion change not shortly, God forbid it be otherwise. Amen, if you love her, for the lady is very well worthy. You speak this to fetch me in, my lord. By my throat, I speak my thoughts. And in faith, my lord, I spoke mine. And by mine too, faith and troth, my lord, I spoke mine. <laughs> She is worthy, I know. That I neither feel how she should be loved nor know how she should be worthy is the opinion that fire cannot melt out of me. I will die in it at the stake. <laughs> Thou wast ever an obstinate heretic in the despot of beauty, and never could make Jane his part but in the force of his will. <laughs> that a woman conceived me, I thank her. That she brought me up, I likewise give her most humble thanks. But that I will have a retreat winded in my forehead or hang my bugle in an invisible baldric, all women shall pardon me. Because I will not do them the wrong to mistrust any, I will do myself the right to trust none. And the fine is, for which I may go the finer, I will live a bachelor. I shall see thee ere I die, look pale with love. <laughs> with anger, with hunger, or with sickness, my lord, not with love. Else hang me on the door of a brothel house for the sign of blind Cupid. Well, if ever thou dost fall from this argument, thou wilt prove a nautical argument. If I do, hang me in a bottle like a cat and shoot at me. And let he that hits me be clapped on the shoulder and called Archer. Well, as time shall try, in time the savage bull can bear the yoke. <laughs> the savage bull may, my lord. But if ever the sensible Benedict bear it, pluck off the bull's horns and set them in my forehead. And let me be vilely painted, and in such great letters as they write, here is good horse to hire. Let them signify under my sign, here you may see Benedict, the married man. If, if this should happen, thou wouldst be horned mad. <laughs> if Cupid have not spent all his quivering minutes, thou wilt fight for this short. Well, I will look for an earthquake too, then. Well, you temper us with the hours. In the meantime, good Senor Benedict, prepare to Leonardo. Commend me to him, tell him I will not fail him to suffer, for indeed he has made great preparation. I have almost matter enough in me for such an emphasis. So I commit you, and so I leave. My leech, your highness now may do me good. My love is thine to teach, teach her but how, and thou shalt see how apt it is to learn any hard lesson that may do thee good. Has Lee not only son, my lord? No child but hero. She's his only heir. Does thou affect her, Claudio? My lord, when you went onward on this ended action, I looked on her with a soldier's eye that white, but had a rubber tasked hand and drive lightning to the name of love. But now I'm returned. And those war thoughts have left their places vacant. And in their rooms come thronging, soft, and delicate desires, all prompting me how fair and sweet hero is. Saying I liked her ere I went to war. Thou would be like a lover shortly, and tired her hero with a book of words. If thou dost love her hero, cherish it, and I will break with her and with her father, and thou shalt have her. Was not to this end that thou begins to twist so fine a story? How sweetly you do minister to love, that no love's grief by his complexion. But lest my liking might too sudden seem, I would have salved it with a longer tree. What need the bridge which brought it in the flood? The fairest grant is the necessity. Look, what will serve as fits is once thou lovest, and I will fit thee with the remedy. I know we shall have reveling tonight. I will assume thy part in some disguise and tell fair hero I am fine of him. And in her bosom I will unclasp my heart and take her hairy prisoner with the force and, and amorous encounter of my tail. And after to her father will I break. And the conclusion is, she shall be mine. In practice, let us put it presently. How now, brother? Where's my cousin? I he provided this music. Oh, he's very busy about it. <coughs> brother, I can tell you strange news.
news that you yet dreamt not of. Are they good? Well, as he then stamps them, but they have a good cover. They show well outward. <laughs> now, the prince and Count Claudius, walking in a thick fleet of alley in my orchard, were thus much overheard by a man of mine. The prince discovered to Claudio that he loved my niece, your daughter, and meant to acknowledge it this night in a dance. And if he found her court, meant to take the present time by the top and instantly break with you of it. Not the fellow any witch who told you that she has a good sharp fellow. Well, I'll send for him and question him yourself. No, no. <coughs> we will hold it in a dream till it appear itself. But I will acquaint my daughter with all that she may the better be prepared for an answer if her adventure this be true. Go you and tell her of it. occasion that breeds, therefore the sadness is without limit. Thus to your reason. And when I have heard it, what blessing brings it? But not a present remedy, at least a patient sufferance. I wonder <laughs> that thou, being as thou sayest thou art, born under Saturn, goest about to apply a moral medicine to a mortifying mischief. I cannot hide what I am. I must be sad when I have cause and smile at no man's jest. Eat when I have stomach and wait for no man's leisure. Sleep when I am drowsy and tend on no man's business. Laugh when I am merry and claw no man in his humor. Yea, but you must not make the full show of this till you may do it without controlment. You have of late stood out against your brother who has ta newly taken you into his grace, where it is impossible for you to take true root but by the fair weather you make for yourself. It is needful that you frame the season for your own harvest. I had rather be a canker in a hedge than a rose in his grace. And it better fits my blood to be disdained of all than to fashion a carriage to rob love from any. In this, though I cannot be said to be a flattering, honest man, yet it must not be denied I am a plain dealing villain. I am trusted with a muzzle and enfranchised with a block. Therefore, I have decreed not to sing in my cage. If I had my mouth, I would bite. I had my liberty, <laughs> I would do my liking. In the meantime, let me be that I am and seek not to alter me. Can you make no use of your discontent? I make all use of it, for I use it only. <laughs> Who comes here? What news, Boracchio? I came yonder from a great supper. The prince, your brother, is royally entertained by Leonato, and I can give you intelligence of an intended marriage. Will it serve for any model to build mischief on? What is he for a fool that betroths himself to unquietness? Mary, it is your brother's right hand. Ooh, the most exquisite Claudio. Even he. A proper squire. And who? And who? Which way looks he? Mary, on hero. Daughter and heir to Leonato. A very forward march, Chick. How came you to this? Being entertained for a perfumer as I was smoking a musty room, comes me the prince and Claudio arm in arm in sad conference. I whipped me behind the heiress, and there heard it agreed upon the prince should woo Hero for himself, and having obtained her, give her to Claudio. Come, come, let us thither. This may prove food to my displeasure. That young startup hath all the glory of my overthrow. If I can cross him anyway, I bless myself every way. You are both sure and will assist me to the death, my lord. Let us to the great supper. Their cheer is the greater that I am subdued. Would the cook were of my mind. Come. Shall we go prove what's to be done? We'll wait upon your lordship. Has not Count John here at supper? Well, I saw him not. How tartly that gentleman looked. I never can see him, but I'm heartburned an hour after. <laughs> he is of a very melancholy disposition. It were an excellent man that were made just in the midway between him and Benedict. The one is too like an image and says nothing. The other two like my lady's eldest son, evermore tattling. 
You bet half Senior Benedict's tongue in Count John's mouth, and half Count John's melancholy in Senior Benedict's face. <laughs> With a good leg and a good foot, Uncle, and money enough in his purse, such a man would win any woman in the world if he could get her good will. <laughs> By my troth, niece, thou wilt never get thee a husband if thou be so shrewd of thy tongue. Oh, faith, she's too cursed. Too cursed is more than cursed. I shall lessen God's sending that way, for it is said that God sends a cursed cow, short horn, but to a cow too cursed, he sends none. So by being too cursed, God will send thee no horn. Just if he send me no husband. For the which blessing, I am at him, upon my knees, every morning and every evening. Lord, I could not endure a husband with a beard on his face. I had rather lie in the woolen. Uh, thou mayest uh, light on a husband that hath no beard. Oh, and what should I do with him? Dress him in my apparel and make him my waiting gentlewoman. <laughs> he that hath a beard is more than a youth, and he that hath no beard is less than a man. But he that is more than a youth is not for me, and he that is less than a man, well, I am not for him. <laughs> Therefore, I will even take sixpence in earnest of the bear herd and lead his apes into hell. Then go you into hell? No, but to the gate, and there will the devil meet me, like an old cockle, with horns on his head, and say, Get you to heaven, Beatrice! Get you to heaven! Here's no place for you, maid. <laughs> and so deliver I up my ace, and away to St. Peter for the heavens. He shows me where the bachelors sit, <laughs> and there live we, as merry as the day is long. <laughs> oh. Well, niece, I trust you will be ruled by your father. Yes, Faith. It is my cousin's duty to make courtesy and say, Father, as it please you. <laughs> But for all that, cousin, let him be a handsome fellow, or else make another curtsy and say, Father, as it please me. <laughs> well, niece, I hope to see thee one day fitted with a husband. Not till God make men of some other metal than earth. <laughs> <laughs> Would it not grieve a woman to be overmastered with a pierce of valiant dust? To make an account of her life to a clod of wayward mars. No, Uncle, I'll not. Adam's sons are my brethren. And truly, I hold it a sin to match in my kindred. <laughs> Daughter, remember the things I told you. If the prince do solicit you in that kind, you know your answer. Oh, the fault be in the music, cousin, if you be not wooed in good time. If the prince be too important, tell him there is measure in everything, and so death has the answer. For hear me, hero, wooing, wedding, and repenting is as a scotch jig, a measure, and a syncope. The first suit is hot and hasty as a scotch jig, full as fantastical. The wedding, mannerly modest, as a measure, full of state and ancientry, and then comes repentance. <laughs> and with his bad leg, falls into the thick of it. That's your dancer, silly thing, up into his grave. My cousin, you apprehend passing truth. I have a good eye, Uncle. I can see a church by daylight. <laughs> ah, the revelers are entering. Brother, make good room. Lady, will you walk about with your friend? Will you walk softly in the sweet and say nothing? I'm yours for the walk, and especially when I walk away. With me in your company? I may say so when I please. And when please you to say so. When I like your favor, for God forbid that we should be like the case. Speak low if you speak love. Why, well, what you did like me? So would not I, for your own sake, for I have many ill qualities. Which is what? I say my prayers aloud. I don't hear the law. The hearers will cry all day. God knocks me with a good answer. I know you well enough. You are Signor Antonio. Oh, better word I'm not. I know you by the waggling of your head. Oh, to tell you the truth, I can't oh, oh, You could never do him so ill well unless you were the very man. Here's his dry hand up and down. You are he. You are he. Oh, the word. I'm not. Come, come. Do you think I do not know you by 
by your excellent wit. Can virtue hide itself? Go to mum, you are he. Graces will appear. And there's next. <laughs> will you not tell me who told you so? No, you shall pardon me. Nor will you not tell me who you are? Not now. That I was disdainful, and that I had my good wit out of the hundred merry tales. Well, this would have been your Benedict that said so. What is he? I'm sure you know him well enough. Not I, believe me. Did he never make you laugh? I pray you, what is he? Why, he's the Prince of Jester. <laughs> impossible slanders, none but libertines delight in him, and the commendation is not in his wit, but in his villainy. <laughs> For he both pleases men and angers them, and then they laugh at him and beat him. <laughs> Answer I in the name of Benedict. But hear these ill news with the ears of Claudio. Tis certain so the prince woos for himself. Friendship is constant in all things save the offices and affairs of love. Therefore, let all hearts and love use their own tongues, and every eye negotiate for itself and trust no agent. For beauty is a witch against whose fate charm melteth into blood. This is an accident of hourly proof, which I must trust in not. Farewell, therefore, hero. Now, Claudio. Yea, the same. Come, will you go with me? Whither? Even to the next willow about your own business, county. What fashion will you wear the garland of? About your neck like a usurer's chain, or, <laughs> or under your arm like a lieutenant's scarf. You must wear it one way, for the prince has got your hero. I wish him joy of her. I've spoken like an honest drovier. So they sell bullocks, but did you think the prince would have served you thus? I pray you leave me. Oh, now you strike like a blind man. T'was the boy who stole your meat, and you'll beat the Pope. If it will not be, I'll leave you. Alas. Poor hurt foul. <laughs> now they creep into hedges. that my lady Beatrice should know me, and not know me, the princess fool. Ha! It may be that I go under that title because I am merry. Yea, but I am apt to do myself wrong. I am not so reputed. It is the base, though bitter disposition of Beatrice, which puts the world in her purse and so gives me out. Well, I'll be revenged as I may. Now, senor, where's the count? Did you see him? Troth, my lord, I have played the part of Lady Faith. I found him here as melancholy as a lodge in a warrant. I told him, and I think I told him true, that your grace had got the goodwill of this young lady. And I offered him my company to a willow tree, either to make him a garland as being forsaken, 
or to bind them up a rod as being worthy to be whipped. To be whipped? What's his fault? The flat transgression of a schoolboy, who being overjoyed with finding his bird's nest, shows it to his companion and he steals it. Well, thou make a trust to transgression. The transgression is as a stealer. Yet it had not been amiss the rod had been made. And the garland, too, for the garland he might have worn himself. And the rod he might have bestowed on you, who, as I take it, have stolen his bird's nest? I will but teach them to sing and restore them to the owner. Well, if they're singing and so you're saying, by my faith, you say honestly. The Lady Beatrice has a quarrel to you. The gentleman that danced with her told her she is much drawn by you. Oh! She misused me past the endurance of a block. An oak, but with one green leaf on it, would have answered her. My very visor began to assume life and stole with her. She told me, not thinking I had been myself, that I was was the prince's jester, that I was duller than a great doll huddling jest upon jest with such impossible conveyance upon me that I, I stood like a man of the mark with a whole army shooting at him. She speaks poignant and every word stabs. If her breath were as terrible as her terminations, there were no living near her. <laughs> she went back to the North Star. I would not marry her. Although she were endowed with all that Adam had left him before he transgressed. <laughs> Come, speak not of it. I would to God some scholar would conjure her, for certainly, while she is here, a man may live as quiet in her panel as in her sanctuary. And people sit upon purpose because they would go thither. <laughs> so indeed, all disquiet, horror, and perturbation follow her. <laughs> Look, here she comes. Would your grace command me any service to the world's end? I will go now on the slightest errand to the antipodes that you can devise to send me on. I will, I will fetch you a toothpicker from the furthest inch of Asia. Bring you the length of Prester John's foot. Fetch you a hair off the great Chan's beard. Do you any emphasis to the pygmies rather than hold three words conference with this, this harpy? You have no employment for it. None but to desire your good company. Oh, God, sir, here is a dish I love not. I cannot endure my lady tongue. <laughs> come, lady, come. You have lost the heart to Senor Benedict. Indeed, my lord. He lent it me a while, and I gave him use for it. A double heart for his single one. Mary, he won it of me once with false dice. Therefore, your grace may well say I have lost. You have put him down, lady. You have put him down. So I would not he should do me, my lord, lest I prove the mother of fools. I have brought Count Claudio, whom you sent me to see. Why, how now, Count? Wherefore are you saying? Not sad, my lord. How then? Sick? Neither, my lord. The Count is neither sad nor sick, nor merry nor well. But civil, Count, civil as an orange, and something of that jealous complexion. I think, lady, I think your belief should be true, though I be sworn, if he be so, his conceit is false. Here, Claudio, I have wounded in thy name, and fair hero is one. I have broke with her father, and his good will obtain. Name the day of marriage, and God give thee joy. Count, take of thee my daughter, and with her my fortune. His grace hath made the match, and all grace say amen to it. Amen. amen. Speak, Count, tis your cue. Silence is the perfect is herald of joy. I would be a little happy if I could say how much. Lady, as you are mine, I am yours. I give myself away for you and dote upon the exchange. See, cousin, or if you cannot, stop his mouth with a kiss, and let not him speak neither. So she does, cousin. Good Lord for a lion! And so goes everyone to the world but I, and I am sunburnt. I may sit in a corner and cry hey-ho for a husband. <laughs> I won't get you one. I had rather have one of your fathers get it. Have your grace there a brother like you? 
Your father got excellent husbands if a maid could come by them. Well, you have me, lady? <laughs> no, my lord. Unless I might have another for working days. Your grace is too costly to wear every day. But I beseech your grace, pardon me. I was born to speak all mirth and no matter. Your silence most offends me, and to be merry best becomes you. For out of question, you were born in a merry hour. No, sure, my lord, my mother cried. <laughs> but then there was a star dance, and under that was I born. Cousin, God give you joy. Niece, will you look to those things I told you of? I cry your mercy, uncle. Uh, by your grace's pardon. By my trope, a pleasant spirited lady. Uh, uh, there's little of the melancholy element in her, my lord. She's never sad but when she sleeps, and not ever sad then. For my daughter told me that when she sometimes sleeps, she laughs as she goes to sadness in her sleep, but wakes herself with laughing. <laughs> she cannot endure to hear it tell of a husband. Oh, my Louise, she mocks all her wounds out of salute. <laughs> she were an excellent wife for Benedict. <laughs> If they were but a week married, they would talk themselves mad. Captain <laughs> <laughs> Claudio, when mean you to go to church? Tomorrow, my lord. Time goes on crutches till love hath all his rights. Uh, not till Monday, my dear son, which is hence a just seven night, and a time too brief to to have all things answer my mind. Um, you shake the head at so long a breathing, but I'll warrant thee, Claudio, the time shall not go dully by us. I will, in the interim, undertake one of Hercules' labors, which is bring Senor Benedict and the Lady Beatrice into a mountain of affection to one with the other. I would fain have it imagined, I doubt not, not but the fashion is, that ye three will but minister such assistance as I shall give you direction. Uh -huh. My lord, I'm with you, though it cost me ten nights watching. And I, my lord. And you too, gentle hero? I will do any modest office, my lord, to help my cousin to a good husband. And Benedict is not the unhopeless husband that I know. Thus far can I praise him. He is of a noble strain, of approved valor, and confirmed honesty. I will teach you how to view your cousin that she shall fall in love with Benedict. And I, with your two help, will so practice on Benedict that in spite of his quick wit and his queasy stomach, he shall fall in love with Beatrice. If we can do this, Cupid is no longer an archer. His glory shall be ours, for we are the only love gods. Go in with me, and I'll tell you my drill. It is so. The Count Claudio shall marry the daughter of Leonato. Yea, my lord, but I can cross it. Any cross, any bar, any impediment will be medicinable to me. I am sick in displeasure to him. Whatsoever comes athwart his affection ranges evenly with mine. How canst thou cross this marriage? Not honestly, my lord, but so covertly no dishonesty shall appear in me. Show me briefly how. I think I told your lordship a year since how much I am in the favor of Margaret, the waiting gentlewoman to hero. I remember. I can at any unseasonable instant of the night appoint her to look out at her lady's chamber window. What life is in that to be the death of this marriage? The poison of that lies in you to temper. Go you to the prince your brother. Spare not to tell him that he hath wronged his honor in marrying the renowned Claudio, whose estimation do you uh, mightily hold up, to a contaminated stale, such a one as hero. What proof shall I make of that? Proof enough to misuse the prince, to vex Claudio, to undo Hero and kill Leonato, look you for any other issue. Only to despite them will I endeavor anything. Go then, find me a meet hour to draw Don Pedro and Count Claudio alone. Tell them that you know that Hero loves me. Intend a kind of zeal, both to the prince and Claudio, as in love of your brother's honor, who has made this match, and his friend's reputation, who is thus like to be cousin with the semblance of a maid that you have discovered thus. They will scarce believe this without trial. Offer them instances which will bear no less likelihood than to see me at her chamber window. Hear me call Margaret Hero. 
and bring them to see this the very night before the intended wedding. For in the meantime, I will so fashion it that heroes shall be absent, and there will appear such seeming truth of heroes' disloyalty that jealousy shall be called assurance, and all the preparations overthrown. Robust to what adverse issue it can, I will put it in practice. Be cunning in the working of this, and thy fee is a thousand ducats. Be you constant in the accusation, my cunning shall not fail me. I will presently go learn their day of marriage. <laughs> Boy! Senor? In my chamber window lies a book. Bring it hither to me in the orchard. How you here already, sir? I know that! But then have the Hanson here again! I do much wonder that one man, seeing how much another man is a fool when he dedicates his behaviors to love, will, after he hath laughed at such shallow follies in others, become the argument of his own scorn by failing in love. And such a man is Claudius. I have known when there was no music with him but the drum and the fife. Now had he rather hear the tabor and the pipe. I have known when he would have walked ten miles afoot to see a good armor. Now will he lie ten nights awake, carving the fashion of a new doublet. <laughs> he was wont to speak plain and to the purpose, like an honest man and a soldier. Now is he turned to oratory. His words are a very fantastical banquet. Just so many strange dishes. <coughs> May I be so converted and see with these eyes? I cannot tell. I think not. I, I will not be sworn, but love may transform me to an oyster. <laughs> but I'll take my own part. Till he hath made an oyster of me, he shall never make me such a fool. One woman is fair, yet I am well. Another is virtuous, yet I am well. Another wise, yet I am well. But till all these graces be in one woman, one woman shall not come in my grace. Rich she'll be, that's certain. <laughs> wise, or I'll none. Virtuous, or I'll never cheapen her. Fair, or I'll never look on her. Mild, or come not near me. A noble, or not I for an angel. Of good discourse, an excellent musician, and her hair shall be... Uh, what color it please God? <laughs> ha! The prince and Marcel love. I will hide me in the arbor. <coughs> Come, shall we hear this music? Yea, my lord. How still the evening is, as if hushed on purpose. Grace Harmony. See you with Benedict and Benedict Oh, very well, my lord. Come, Balthazar, we'll hear that song again. Oh, good, my lord, do not tax so bad a voice to slam the music any more than once. It is a witness still of excellency to put a strange face on his own perfection. I pray thee, sing, and let me woo no more. Because you speak of wooing, I shall sing. Since many a wooer doth commence his suit to her, you think not worthy. Yet he woos, yet will he swear he loves. <coughs> now, pray thee, come. Or, if thou wilt hold a longer argument, do it in notes. Note this before my notes. There's not a note of mine that's worth the noting. Why, these are very crotchets that he speaks. Notes, notes, forsooth, and no fame. Now the thine air. Now is his soul ravished. Is it not strange that sheep's guts should hail souls out of men's bodies? <laughs> well, I'm more for my money when all's done.
hath a contemptible spirit. <laughs> he is a very proper man. <laughs> he hath indeed a good outward happiness before God, and in my mind exceeding wise. He does indeed show some sparks that are like <laughs> with. <laughs> oh, and I take him to be valiant. As Hector, I assure you. Well, I am sorry for your niece. Shall we go seek Benedict to tell him of her love? Never tell him, my lord. Let her wear it out with good counsel. Nay, that were impossible. She may wear out her heart first. <laughs> Come, my lord. Dinner is ready. You want? If you do not dote on her upon this, I'll never trust my expectation. Let the same net be spread for her, and that must your daughter and her gentlewomen carry. The sport will be when they hold one an opinion of another's dotage. And no such matter, that's the thing that I would see, which will be merely a dumb show. <laughs> <laughs> Let's send her to call him into dinner. <laughs> trick? The conference of it was sadly born. They have the truth of this from Hero. <laughs> they seem to pity the lady. Well, it seems her affections have their full bent. Love me? Why, it must be requited. I hear how I am censored. They say I will bear myself proudly if I perceive the love come from her. They say, too, that she will rather die than give any sign of her affection. Huh? Did never think to marry. I must not seem proud. Happy are they that can hear their detractions and put them to mimic. I say the lady is fair. Huh? Tis the truth. I can bear the witness. <laughs> and virtuous. Well, just so I can never prove it. And wise. But for loving me? <laughs> well, by my troth, it is no addition to her wit. <laughs> Nor no great argument of her folly. For I will be horribly in love with her. <laughs> I may chance have some odd quirks or remnants of wit broken on me. Well, because I have railed so long against marriage. But does not the appetite alter? A man loves the meat in his youth that he cannot endure in his age. Shall these quips and sentences and these paper bullets of the brain awe a man from the career of his humor? No! <laughs> the world must be peopled! <laughs> and I did say I would die a bachelor? Well, I never think I should live till I were married. <laughs> She's a fair lady. I do spy some marks of love in her. <laughs> Against my will, I am sent to bid you come into dinner. Fair Beatrice, I thank you for thy pains. I took no more pain for those things than you took pain to thank me. If it had been painful, I would not have come. You take pleasure then in the message? <laughs> And 
bid her steal the pleached bower, where honeysuckles, brightened by the sun, forbid the sun's entrance. Like favorites, made proud by princes, that have been her prize, against that power that bred it. There will she hide her to look at her This is thy office, bear thee well in it, and leave us alone. I'll make her come, I warrant you presently. <laughs> now, Ursula, when Beatrice soft comes, as we do face this alley up and down, our talk must only be a Benedict. <laughs> Excellent. Good. 
and Maiden Prime. Change your mind. May this be so. 
I will not think. If you dare not trust that you see, confess not that you know. If you will follow me, I will show you enough. And when you have seen more and heard, heard more, proceed accordingly. If I see anything tonight why I should not marry her, tomorrow in the congregation where we wed, there will I shame her. And as I would for thee to obtain her, I will join with thee to disgrace her. I will disparage her no further till you are my witnesses. Bear it coldly but till midnight. And let the issue show itself. O oh, day untowardly turn, O oh, mischief strangely thwarting, O oh, plague right well prevented. So shall you say when you have seen the sequel. Men in true? Yay, or else it were pity, but they should suffer salvation body and soul. Nay, they were punishment too good for them if they have any allegiance in them being chosen for the prince's watch. <laughs> well, give them their charge, neighbor dog Mary. First, who think you the most desertless man to be constable? Ah, uh, Hugh Otakek, sir, or George Seacole, for they can both write and read. Come hither, neighbor Seacole. <laughs> Thou art considered to be the most senseless and fit man. <laughs> to be constable, therefore, bear you the lantern. This is your charge. You are to comprehend all vagrom men. You are to bid any man stand in the prince's name. Constable will not stand. Why then, let him go. <laughs> then, presently, bring the watch together, and thank God you're rid of a name. <laughs> you will not stand when he is bidden, then he is none of the prince's subject. And they are to meddle with none but the prince's subjects. You are to make no noise in the streets. For the watch to babble and talk is most tolerable and not to be endured. We will rather sleep than talk. We know that. We know what to watch. You speak like an ancient and most quiet watchman, for I cannot see how sleep shall offend. You are to go about all the alehouses and bid those that are drunk get them to bed. How if they will not? Wait till they are sober. <laughs> if they make you not the better answer, you may say they were not the men you took them for. Well, sir, if you meet a thief, you may suspect him by virtue of your office to be no true man. And for such men, the less you meddle or make with them, why, the more is for your honesty. If we know a man to be a thief, shall we not lay hands upon him? <sighs> Truly, by your office, you may. But I think they that touch pitch shall be defiled. No. The more peaceable way for you, if you do take a thief, is to let him show himself what he is and steal away from your company. <laughs> you have always been called a merciful man, partner. I wouldn't hang a dog by my will, much less any man who hath any honesty in him. <laughs> if you hear a child crying in the night, you must call to the nurse and bid her steal it. How if the nurse is asleep and, and will not hear us? Then depart peaceably and let the child wake her with crying. <laughs> For the ewe that will not hear her lamb when it buzz will never answer a calf when it bleeds. Tis very true. This is the end of the charge. You constable are to present the prince's own man. If you meet him in the night, you may stay. Nay, by your lady, that I think I cannot. Five shillings to one on it. With any man who knows the standards, he may stay him. Mind you, not unless the prince be willing. For the watch ought to offend no man. And it is an offense to stay a man against his will. By your lady, but I think you'd be so. <laughs> well, good night. Come, good neighbor. Well, master, to hear our charge. Let's go sit here till two and then on the bed. <sighs> pray thee, good the neighbors. I pray thee. Watch about the senior of the Anathos door. <laughs> For the wedding there tomorrow, there is great coil tonight. I do. Be vigilant. I beseech you. Come there. Uh, Conrad! Oh, peace, master. Stir not. Conrad, I say! Here, man, I'm at my elbow. <laughs> That's at my elbow, man. I thought there was a scab follow. <laughs> oh, 
I'll be an answer for that. Now, forward with thy tail. And he cloaks it under the tent. <laughs> with drizzles rain, and I will, like a true drunkard, utter all to thee. Some treason masters, yet stand close, but know that I have tonight of Don John earned a thousand ducats. Is it possible that his villainy should be so dear? I should have rather at it is possible any villainy should be so rich when rich villains have need of poor ones. Poor ones may make what price they will. How wonderful that is. That shows thou art unconfirmed. Thou knowest that the, the fashion of a new doublet or a hat or a new cloak means nothing to a man. Yes, it is apparel. I mean the fashion. Yes, the fashion is the fashion. Fish, I may as well say the fool's the fool. Yes, thou not, I say, what a deformed thief this fashion is. All this I say, and I say that the fashion wears out more apparel than the man. But art not thou thyself giddy with the fashion, too, that thou hast shifted out of thy tail into telling me of the fashion? No, no, neither. But know that I have tonight wooed Margaret by the name of Hero. She leans me out of her window and bids me a thousand times good night. I tell this tale vilely. I should have first tell thee how the prince and Claudio and my master, Don John, planted and placed and possessed by my master, Don John, so afar off in the orchard, this amiable encounter. <laughs> and I say, Margaret was hero. Two of them did. But the devil, my master, knew she was Margaret, and partly by his oaths, which did first possess them, and partly by the dark night, which did deceive them, but chiefly by my villainy. <laughs> Away goes Claudio, enraged, swore he would meet her as was appointed next morning at the temple, and there, before the whole congregation, shame her with what he saw o'er the night, and send her home again without a husband. <laughs> we charge you in the prince's name. Stand. Come to bring Dr. Constable. We hear come the most vile piece of lechery that ever was known in the Commonwealth. <laughs> Come with us. 
light as love with your heels then. If your husband have stables enough, you'll see he shall lack no barn. Oh, well, the dimming construction. I have gone that with my heels. Tis almost five o'clock, cousin. Tis time you were ready. By my truth, I'm exceeding ill. Hey-ho. Oh. love the Count sent me. They're an excellent perfume. Uh, it's just because I cannot smell it. A maid and stuff. Now there's good the catching of cold. Oh. Friar Francis, brief, I pray you, only to the plain form of marriage. You may recount their particular duties after. You come hither, my lord, to marry this lady? No. 
should be married to her. Why are you coming to marry her? Lady, you come hither to be married to this count? I do. If either of you know of any inward impediments, why the two of you should not be conjoined, charge you on your soul to utter it. Know you any hero? None, my lord. Know you any count? I dare make his answer none. Oh! What men dare do? What men may do? What men daily do, not knowing what they do? Now, now, interjections? Why, some be a laughing and... <laughs> Stand by, Friar. Father, by your leave, will you with free and unconstrained soul give me this maid, your daughter? As freely, son, as God did give her me. And what have I to give you back whose worth may counterpoise this rich and precious gift? Nothing, unless you render her again. Sweet prince, you learn me noble thankfulness. There you go! Give up this one more to your friend. She is but the sign and semblance of her honor. Behold, how like a maid she blushes. Oh, what authority and show of truth can cunning sin cover itself with all. Would you not swear, all you that see her, that, that she were made by these exterior souls? But she is none. She knows the heat of a luxurious bed. Her blush is guiltiness, not modesty. What do you mean, my lord? Not to be married. Not to knit my soul to an approved wife. Dear my lord, if thou and thy proofs ever made defeat of her to virginity and... I know what you would say. If I have known her, you would say she did embrace me as a husband and so extenuate the forehand of sin. But no, Leonato, not I never tempted her with words too large. But as a brother, to a sister, so bashful sincerity and comely love. It seems I am on the way to you. Not only is I a right against it. You seem to me as Diane in her orb, as chaste as the bud ere it be blown. But you are more intemperate in your blood than Venus. For those favored animals that rage in savage sensuality. Is my lord well? <laughs> Did he not speak so wise? Sweet <laughs> prince, what speak not you? Why should I speak? I stand dishonored that have gone about to link my dear friend to a common stale. <gasps> are these words spoken, or do I but dream? Well, they are spoken, and these things are true. This looks not like a nuptial. True, oh God! Be not to <laughs> stand I here. Is this the prince? Is, is this the prince's brother? Is this face hero? Are her eyes our own? All oh, this is so, but what of this, my lord? Let me move one question to your daughter. By that fatherly and kindly power you have in her, bid her answer truly. I charge thee, do so as thou art my child. Oh, God, defend me. How am I being set? What kind of care is I to you this? To make you answer truly to your name. That can, hero. Hero himself can blot out hero's virtue. What man was he talking to you yesterday out at your window between 12 and 1? No, if you are a maid, answer to this. I talked with no man at the hour of the Why then are you no maiden? Leonardo, I'm sorry you must hear, but on my honor, myself, my brother, and this grieved count, you see her here, her, in that hour last night. Talk with a ruffian as her chamber window who hath indeed most like a liberal villain confess the vile encounters they have had a thousand times in secret. Aye, aye, they are not to be named, my lord, not to be spoken of. There is not chastity enough in language without offense to utter them. Thus, pretty lady, I am sorry for thy much misgovernment. O oh, hero, what a hero hast thou been? If half thy outward graces hath been placed upon thy thoughts and the counsels of thy heart. But fare thee well, most foul, most fair. Farewell, now pure in piety and envious purity. For thee I'll lock up all the gates of love, and all my eyelids shall conjecture hang, and turn all beauty into thoughts of harm, and never shall it be more gracious. No man's dagger here up wait for me? Now, hero, wherefore think you now? Come, let us away. These things come thus to light, smother her spirits up. How does the lady? Dead, I see! <coughs> Uncle, help! Hero! Hero! Uncle! Senor Benedict! Friar! Oh, 
strength. Take not away thy heavy hand. Death is the fairest cover for her shame that may be weak. Oh. How now, hero? Have comfort, lady. Dost thou look up? Yea, wherefore should she not? Wherefore? Why does not every earthly thing cry shame upon her? Could she here deny the story that is written in her blood? Do not live, hero. Do not open thine eyes. For didst I think thou wouldst not quickly die? Thought I thy spirits were stronger than thy shame. Myself would, on the rear one way of strike. Grieved I, I have to come. Chide I for that frugal nature's frame? Oh, one too much by thee. Why had I won? Why ever wast thou so lovely in mine eyes? Why had I not with charitable hand took up a beggar's issue at my gates, who thus smirched and mired with infamy? I might have said, no part of this is mine. This shame derives itself from unknown loans. But mine. Mine I loved, and mine I praised, and mine I was proud of, and mine so much that I myself was to myself, not mine, valuing of her. Oh, she hath fallen into a pit of ink, yet the wide sea hath drops too few to watch her clean again, and salt too little, which may cease and give to her foul, tainted flesh. But be patient. For my part, I am so attired in wonder, I don't know what to say. Oh, on my soul, my cousin is belied. Lady, were you her bedfellow last night? No, truly not. But until last night, I have this twelve months been her bedfellow. Confirmed, confirmed, oh, that is stronger made, which were before fired with ribs of iron. For the two princes lie, would Claudio lie who loved her so, and in speaking of her foulness, wash it with tears? Hence from a her, let her die. Oh. Hear me a little, for I have only been silent so long, and given way unto this course of fortune. By noting of the lady, I have marked a thousand blushing apparitions to start in her face. Thousand innocent shames and angel whiteness beat back those blushes. And in her eye there hath appeared a fire to burn the error these princes hold against her maiden truth. Call me a fool. Trust not my reading nor observation. Trust not my age, my calling, my reverence, nor divinity. If this sweet lady lie here not guiltless under some biting error, prior, this cannot be. Thou seest that all the grace she hath left is that she will not add to her damnation a sin of perjury. Lady, not deny me. Why seekest thou then to cover with excuse that which appears in proper naked? Lady, what man is it he you are accused of? They know that you accuse me. I know not. If I know more than any man alive, than that which made modesty not Let all my sins like mercy go pardon. Prove you that any man can persecute our such meat, or that I yesterday maintain the change of words with any creature. Refuse me, hate me, torture me to death. <laughs> There's some strange misprison in these princes. Two of them have the very bent of honor. And if their wisdoms be misled in this, the purpose of it lies in John the Baptist, whose spirits toil in frame abilities. I know not. If they speak for truth of her, these hands shall tear her hands. If they wrong her honor, the proudest of them shall well hear of it. I have you not yet so dried this blood of mine, nor age so eat up mine invention, nor fortune such have it made of my means, nor my sad life reft me so much of friends, 
that they shall find awake in such a kind both strength of limb and policy of mind, ability and means and choice of friends to quit me of them truly. Pause a while and let my counsel sway you in this case. Your daughter here, the prince is left for dead. Let her while be secretly kept in and publish it that she is dead indeed. Maintain a mourning occupation, and on your family's old monument, hang mournful epitaphs, and do all rites that appertain unto a burial. What will this do? What shall become of this? Mary, this well carried shall, on her behalf, turn slander into remorse. That is some good. She dying, as it must be so maintained, on the instant she was accused, shall be lamented, pity, and excused of every hearer. For it so falls out that what we have, we prize not for the worth whilst we enjoy it. But being lacked and lost, why then we rack the value. Then we find the virtue that possession would not show us whilst it was ours. So it shall fare with Claudia. When he shall hear that she died upon his word, the idea of her life shall sweetly creep into his study of imagination. And every lovely organ of her life shall come apparelled in more precious habit, more moving delicate and full of life in the eye and prospect of his soul than when she lived in thee. Then shall he mourn if ever love had interest in his liver wish he had not so accused her. No, though he thought his accusation true. Let this be so, and doubt not that success can fashion the event in better shape than I can lay it down in likelihood. But if all aims of this be level fault, the supposition of the lady's death will quench the wonder of her. And if it sort not well, we may conceal her, as best befits her wounded reputation, in some reclusive and religious life, away from all eyes, tongues, minds, and injury. Senor Leonardo, let the friar advise you. And though you know my love and inwardness is very much under the prince and Claudia, yet by my honor, I will deal with this as secretly and justly as your soul should with your body. Being that I flow in grief, the smallest twine may leave me. Tis well consented. Presently, away. Come, lady, die to live. This wedding day may but be prolonged. Have patience. show such friendship. A very even way, but no such friend. <coughs> May a man do it. It is a man's office, but not yours. I do love nothing in this world so well as you. Not that strange. you love me. 
And I will make him eat it as I love not you. Will you not eat your word? With no sauce that can be devised to it. I protest. I love thee. I then. God forgive me. <laughs> challenge him. I will kiss your hand. And so I leave you. By this hand, Claudio shall render me a dear account. As you hear of me, so think of me. say she is dead. Villains. 
Masters, it is proved already you are a little better than false names. How say you for yourself? Very, sir. We glad we are not. Oh, a marvelously witty fellow. But I will go about with him, I assure you. A word in your ear, sir. Ah. Mm. I say that you are a little better than false names. Sir, I say to you, we are not. Stand and stop. Before God, they are in a tale. Did you write down? They are done. <laughs> Master Cox, you go not the way to examine. You must call forth the watch that are their accusers. Come, bring the watch forward. I charge you in the prince's name, accuse oh. these men. Uh, that man, sir, says that Don John, the prince's brother, was a villain. Write down Prince John of Villain. What blasphemy to call Prince's brother villain? Master Cox. I pray thee peace. I do not like thy look. I promise thee. What heard you him else say? Mary, that he would give a thousand ducats to Don John for accusing the lady hero wrongfully. What burglary has ever been committed? What else? What else, mass it is? What else, fellow? And that uh, Count Claudio did mean, upon his word, disgrace you in front of the whole assembly and not marry her. Thou shalt be condemned into everlasting redemption for this. What else? <laughs> This is all. And this, Master, is more than you can deny. <laughs> Prince John, this very morning, is secretly stolen away. And Hero, in this manner accused, in this very manner refused, is upon the grief of this suddenly died. <sighs> Master Constable, bound these men and had them brought to Leonardo. I will go before and say them very Opinion these men, let them be in the hands. What? Oh, no, no. <laughs> oh, God, my wife. Will the sexton be here to write down Prince's Officer Cox code? Find him. Thou naughty varlet. The word. You are an ass. You are an ass. Dost thou not suspect my place? Dost thou not suspect my ears? <laughs> Masters, remember, I am an ass. <laughs> Though it be not written down, forget not that I am an ass. <laughs> Call down, naughty varlet. Thou art full of piety, and shall be proven by good witness. I am a wise man. Which is more? An officer. Which is more? A householder. Which is more? as pretty a piece of flesh as any in the scene. <laughs> and one that knows the law, go to. And one that has riches, enough, go to. And one that has had losses. And one that has two gowns. And one that has everything handsome about him. <laughs> Take him away. Take him away. Oh, and I've been written down in ass. <laughs> Go on thus, you will kill yourself. And it is not wisdom thus in second grief against yourself. I pray thee cease thy counsel, which falls into mine ears as profitless as water in a sieve. Give me not counsel. Nor let no comforter delight mine ear, but such a one whose griefs do bear with mine. Bring me a father who so loved his child, whose joy of her is overwhelmed like mine. Bid him speak patience. Measure his woe the length and breadth of mine, and let it answer every strain for strength. And I of him will gather patience. But there is no such man. For brother, men can counsel and speak comfort of that grief they themselves not be, but tasting it, their counsel turns to passion, which before would give perceptual medicine to rage, better strong madness in a silken thread, charm ache with air and agony with words. No. Tis all men's office patience to those that ring under the load of sorrow, but no man's virtue nor sufficiency to be so moral when he shall endure the like himself. Therefore, give me not counsel. My griefs cry 
crying louder than advertisement. For well, therein do men from children nothing differ. I pray thee peace. I will be flesh and blood, for there was never yet philosopher that could endure the toothache patiently. You bend not all the harm upon yourself. Make those that do offend you suffer too. There thou speakest reason. Nay, I will do so. My soul doth tell me hero is their lie. That shall Claudio know, so shall the prince, and all those that thus dishonor. Well, here come the prince and Claudio hastily. Good in, good in. Good day to both. Well, here you are, my lords. We have some hastily, and I know some haste, my lords. Well, fare you well, my lords. Are you so hasty now? Nay, do not quarrel with us, good old man. <laughs> if he could right himself with quarreling, some of us would lie low. Who wrongs him? <laughs> Mary, thou dost wrong me, thou December there. Now, no, no, no fear to my sword. I fear thee not. In faith. I admit nothing to my sword. Shush, man, you're clear and jest at me. I speak not like a dotard nor a fool. No, Claudio, to thy head. Thou hast so wronged mine innocent child and me that I am forced to lay my reverence by and with gray hairs and bruise of many days do challenge thee to trial of a man. I say thou hast belied mine innocent child. Thy slander hath gone through and through her. By thy villainy. My villainy? Thine, Claudio, thine. You say not right, old man. My lord, my lord, I'll prove it on his body if he dare, despite his nice fence and active practice, his may of youth and bloom of lust. Away! I will not have to deal with thee. Oh, canst thou so doff me? Thou hast killed mine innocent child, and if thou killest me, boy, Thou shalt kill a man. He shall kill two of us, and men indeed. But that's no matter. Let him kill one first. With me and wear me. Let him answer me. Come. Follow me, boy. Now come, sir, boy. Come follow me. Sir, boy, I'll whip you. There, I'm the gentleman I will. Oh, brother, no, content yourself. God knows I love my niece, and she is dead. Slander to death by villain that dare as well answer a man indeed as I dare take a serpent by the tongue. Boys, apes, brighter, jacks, milk socks, brother Adam. Hold <laughs> yourself content. What man? I know them, yea, and what they weigh, even to the utmost scruple. Scrambling, outfacing, fashion mongering boys that lie and cog and float. Deprave and slander, go antically, show off with hideousness, and, and speak off half a dozen dangerous words how they might hurt their enemies if they durst. And this is all. Uh, content yourself. Do not you meddle. Let me deal in this. Gentlemen, both, we will not wait your patience. My heart is sorry for your daughter's death. But on my honor, she was charged with nothing but what was true and very full of proof. My lord, I will not hear you. No. <laughs> Come, brother, awake. I will be heard and shall, or some of us will smart for it. See, see, here comes the man we went to see. Now, senor, what news? Hey, my lord. Welcome, senor. You are almost come to part almost to pray. <laughs> We'd like to have our two noses snapped off with two old men without teeth. Leonardo and his brother. What think of thou? Had we fought, I doubt we should have been too young for them. <laughs> In a false quarrel, there is no true valor. I came to seek you both. We have been up and down to seek thee, for we are high proof melancholy and would fain have it be delayed. Wilt thou use thy wit? In my scabbard shall I draw it? Just by where thy wit by thy side? Never did any so, but very many of them beside their wit. I will bid thee draw, as we do the minstrels, draw to pleasure us. As I am an honest man, he looks pale. I'm now sick or angry. Sir, I will meet your wit in the career, and you charge it against me. 
I pray you choose another subject. By this light, he changes more and more. I think to be angry indeed. If he be, he knows how to turn his girdle. <laughs> Shall I speak a word in your ear? God bless me from a challenge. You are a villain. I guess not. I will make good how you dare, with what you dare and when you dare. Do me right, or I will protest your cowardice. You have killed a sweet lady, and her death shall fall heavy on you. Let me hear from you. I will meet thee. Fare thee well. Boy, you know my mind. My lord, for your many courtesies, I thank you. I must discontinue your company. Your brother, the bastard, is fled from Messina. You have among you killed a sweet, an innocent lady. For my lord Lackbeard there, <laughs> he and I shall meet. Until then, peace be with you. He is an artist and most profound artist. And I warrant you for love of Beatrice. And he hath challenged thee <clears throat> most sincerely. But talk to you, let me be. Did he not say my brother was fled? Come you, sir. If justice cannot tell you, she will have way more reasons in her valley. And you be a cursing hypocrite once, you need looking to. How now? Two of my brothers being bound, brought you over one, arcing after their offense, my lord. Oh, what offense have these men done? Mary, sir, they have committed false report. Moreover, they have spoken untruth. Secondarily, they are slandered. Sixth and lastly, they have belied a lady. Thirdly, they have verified any untrue things. And to conclude, they are lying names. <laughs> First, I ask you what they have done. Thirdly, I ask you what their offense. Sixth and lastly, why they are committed and... To conclude, what lay you to their charge? Rightly reasoned, and in his own division, and by my trust, there's one meaning well suited. Masters, who have you offended that you are thus bound to your answer? What's your offense? This word is constantly too cunning to be understood. <laughs> Please, friend, let me go no further to mine answer. Do you hear me? And let this count kill me. I have deceived even your very eyes, but your wisdom could not discover. These shallow fools brought to light, who o'er the night overheard me confessing to this man how Don John, your brother, incensed me to slander the lady hero. How you were brought into the orchard and saw me court Margaret in the lady hero's garment. How you disgraced her when you should have married her. My villainy they have upon record, which I had rather seal over with my death than repeat over to my shame. The lady is dead upon mine and my master's false accusation, and briefly, I desire nothing but the reward of a villain. Runs not this speech like iron through your blood? I have drunk poison all the others. But then my brother set me on to this? Yea, and paid me richly for the practice of it. He is composed and framed of treachery. And fled he is upon this villainy. Sweet hero, now my image doth appear in the rare semblance I loved at first. <laughs> Come, bring away the place. <laughs> By now the sexton hath reformed, Signor Leonardo, of the matter. Do not forget to specify, when time and place shall serve, that I am an ass. Hear him! <laughs> so fast the Signor Leonardo and the sexton, too. <laughs> Which is the villain? Let me see his eyes, and when I know another man like him, I may avoid him. Which of these is he? He would know you're wronger. Look on me. Art thou the slave that with thy breath has killed mine innocent child? Yea. 
even I alone. Nay, not so, villain, thou beliest thyself. Here stand a pair of honorable men. A third is fled that had a hand of it. I thank you, Lord, for my daughter's death. Record it with your high and worthy deeds. Twas bravely done if you would think you are. I know not how to bring your patience. Yet I will speak. Choose your revenge yourself. Impose me to what penance your invention can lay upon my sin. Yet I sin not, but am mistaken. By my soul, nor I. And yet, to satisfy this good old man, I will bend under any heavy weight he'll enjoy me to. I cannot bid you bid my daughter live. That were impossible. But I pray you both, possess the people here, how innocent she died. And if your love can labor off in sad invention, hang her an epitaph upon her tomb and sing it to her bones. Sing it tonight. Tomorrow morning come you to my house. And since you could not be my son-in-law, be yet my nephew. My brother hath the dog, almost the copy of my daughter that's dead, and she alone is heir to both of us. Give her the right you should have given her cousin, and so dies my revenge. Oh, noble sir, your overkindness about three years from me. I do embrace your offer, and so dispose for henceforth of poor Claudia. Tomorrow morning I'll expect your coming. Tonight I take my leave. This naughty fellow shall face to face be brought with Margaret, who I believe was packed in all this wrong, hired to it by your fright. No, by myself she was not. Nor knew not what she did when she spoke to me, but has always been just and virtuous in everything as you know by her. Mary, sir, why would this not under white and black? The plaintiff, the accused, did call me an ass. <laughs> I pray thee, sir, examine him on that point. I thank thee for thy care and honest pain. Your worship speaks like a most thankful and reverent youth, and I thank God for you. There's for thy pain. God, save the foundation! Go, I discharge thee of thy prisoner, and I give thee thanks. I leave an errant maid with your worship, which I beseech your worship to correct yourself as an example to others. God, keep your heart. I wish your worship well. God, we score you to help. <laughs> I grant you leave to depart. And if a very meeting be wished, why, God prohibit it. <laughs> Till tomorrow morning, lords, farewell. Farewell, my lord. We look for you tomorrow. We will not fail. Tonight, I'm one with you. Bring you these fellows on. We'll talk with Margaret how her acquaintance grew with this lewd fellow. Uh. <laughs> Pray thee, sweet mistress Margaret, deserve well at my hands by helping me to the speech of Beatrice. Will you then write me a sonnet in praise of my beauty? In so high a style, Margaret, that no man living shall come over it. For most comely truth thou deservest. Quick as the greyhound's mouth. It catches. And yours? <laughs> as blunt as the fencer's coils, which kisses, but hurts not. The most manly wit, Margaret. It will not hurt a woman. And now I pray thee, call Beatrice. I give thee the buckles. Well, I will call Beatrice to you, who I think hath legs. And therefore shall come. For scorn, horn, a hard rhyme, 
and for school, fool of babbling rhyme. Very ominous endings. No, I was not born under a rhyming planet, nor I cannot woo in festival terms. Sweet Beatrice, was thou come when I called thee? Gay, senor, and depart when you bid me. Oh, do but stay till then. Then is spoken. Fare you well now. And yet, ere I go, let me go with that I came, which is with knowing what has passed between you and Claudio. Only foul words. And thereupon, I will kiss thee. A foul words is but foul wind, and foul wind is but foul breath, and foul breath is noisome, therefore I will depart unkissed. <laughs> forcible as I went. But I must tell thee plainly, Claudio undergoes my challenge, and either I must hear from him shortly or subscribe him a coward. I pray thee now tell me, for which of my bad parts didst thou first fall in love with me? <laughs> for them all together, <laughs> which maintain so politic a state of evil that they will not admit any good part to intermit Monument to Leonardo? It is, my lord. Dumb to death by slanderous tongue is the hero that here lies. Death engirded of her wrong is her fame which never dies. And so the life to die in Shame lives in death with glorious fame. Hang thou there upon thy doom, praising her when I am dumb. Now music, sound, and sing your solemn hymn.
Holmes, good night. Yearly will I do this right. Good morrow, Master. Put your torches out. Thanks to you all. And leave us. Fare you well. Good morrow, Master. Each his several way. Come, let us hence and put on other weeds. And then to Leonardo's where we go. Did I not tell you she was innocent? So are the prince and Claudio who accused her upon the error that you heard debated. But Margaret was in some fault in this, although against her will, as it will be shown in the true course of all the questions. Well, I'm glad that all things sort so well. So am I, being else by faith and forced to call young Claudio to a reckoning for it. <laughs> well, daughter, and you gentlewomen all, retire into a chamber by yourself. When I send for you, come here to be. The Prince and Claudio have promised by this hour to visit me. You know your office, brother. You must be father to your brother's daughter and give her to young Claudio. Who which I will do with confirmed countenance. Friar, I must entreat your pains, I think. To do what, senor? To bind me. Or undo me one of them. Senor <laughs> 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 Truth it is, good senor, that your niece regards me with an eye of faith. That eye my daughter lent her, this most true. And I do with an eye of love requite her. <laughs> the sight whereof I think you got from me, from Claudio, and the prince. But what's your will? Your answer, sir, is enigmatical, but for my will, my will is that your goodwill will stand with ours this day to be conjoined in the honorable state of... <laughs> <laughs> Marriage, which I should desire your help, Friar. <laughs> my heart is with your liking. And with my help. Ah, here come the Prince and Claudio. Tomorrow to this fair assembly. Tomorrow, Prince, tomorrow, Claudio. Are you yet determined today to marry with my brother's daughter? I would hold my mind were she in our part. <laughs> All her forth, brother. Here's the prayer ready. Why, Senor Benedict, what's the matter that you have such a February place, so full of frost and storms and cloudiness? I think he thinks upon the savage bull. Touch, fear not, man, look at thy horns with gold, and all your rope is shall rejoice with thee. And once your rope did a lusty joke when he said that we know the feast is love. <laughs> bull Joe, sir, had an amiable love. And some such strange bull leaped your father's cow and got a, same, a calf in that same noble feast. Much like to you, for you have just his bleak. For this I owe you, for here comes other reckoning. Which is the lady I must seize upon? This same is she, and I do give you her. Well, then she's mine. Sweet, let me see your face. No, that you shall not, until you take her hand before this friar and swear to marry her. Give me your hand before this holy friar. I'm your husband. You like it. When I live, I wipe your other wife. And when you love, you are my other husband. Another hero! Nothing, sir. One hero died defiled, but as I do live, I am a maid. The former hero. <laughs> hero that is dead. She died, my lord, but whiles her slander lived. All this amazement can I qualify. When after the holy rites are ended, I will tell you largely of their hero's death. Meantime, let one just seem familiar. And let us presently to the chapel. Soft and fair, Friar. Which is Beatrice? <laughs> I answer to that name. What is your will? Do not you love me? <laughs> no. No more than reason. Well, then your uncle and the prince and Claudio are deceived because that's for you did. Oh, uh, uh, come, cousin, I am sure you love the gentleman. And I'll be sworn upon it 
he loves her for years of paper, written in his own hand, a whole few sonnets of Beatrice. And here's another, written by cousin Sam, stolen from her pocket, containing her affection as definitive. <laughs> Miracle. With our own hands against our hearts. Come, I will have thee. <laughs> Punishments for him. Strike up, Pipers! <laughs> 